true bill of indictment in the name and by the authority of the state of Texas, the grand jury of Dallas County, the state of Texas, duly organized at the July term AD 2015 of the criminal district court number five for the said county upon its oath to present in and to said court at said term. At Christopher Love, here I have to call defendants on or about the second day of September 2015 in the county of Dallas, state of Texas, did unlawfully then and there intentionally cause the death of Kendra Hatcher, an individual, here and after called deceased, by shooting deceased with a firearm, a deadly weapon, and the defendant was then and there in the course of committing and attempting to commit the offense of robbery of said deceased against the peace and dignity of the state, signed by the then criminal district attorney of Dallas County, also signed by the full person of the grand jury. Continue that, Mr. Asher's line, please. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen, it's been not guilty. Does the state wish to make an opening statement? We do, Your Honor. Police court, counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kevin Brooks, and I represent, along with Mr. Fitzmartin, Mr. Moore, Mr. Pfeiffer, Ms. Byrd, and... Ms. Lambert. Ms. Lambert. Ms. Lambert. The state of Texas, in this offense, in this case. The law allows us to present a preview of what we believe the evidence that is going to be put in front of you. But first, I'd like to introduce you to a really remarkable young woman. Her name was Kendra Hatcher, Dr. Kendra Hatcher. She was a pediatric dentist here in Dallas. Kendra grew up in the Midwest, Springfield, Illinois, adult hometown of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. In high school, she was a cheerleader, played volleyball. She was actually captain of the cheerleading squad. After she graduated high school, she moved on to DePaul University, a small liberal arts school in Greencastle, Indiana. After finishing at DePaul, she moved on to the University of Kentucky, where she attended dental school and became a dentist. After finishing dental school, Kendra moved to Houston, Texas, and then in 2010, she moved here to Dallas and began practicing at a dental clinic in Irving called Smile Dentistry. In May of 2015, Kendra met another medical professional, a gentleman by the name of Ricardo Paniagua, a dermatologist. And even though they met in May, that relationship was really starting to take off. Whether or not they would have ended up being married, I can't say that. But Dr. Paniagua will tell you that things were going, that relationship was going somewhere. Now, unfortunately for Kendra, there was one thing in Dr. Paniagua's past that she didn't know. And it's through no fault of hers, and it's certainly through no fault of his. But what she didn't know is that in February of 2015, Dr. Paniagua had ended a two-year on-and-off relationship with another woman. That woman's name was Brenda Delgado. The evidence will show you that, for whatever reason, after he broke it off with Brenda, Brenda just could not let go. You see evidence that Brenda begins to follow him. She shows up where he's taking salsa classes. When he's jogging on the Katy Trail, she shows up jogging in the opposite direction, all under the guise of, what a coincidence, I just happened to be here. Now, during this time, Brenda's also stalking him online. She's gotten access to his Facebook account. She's hacked into his cell phone, and she's following him everywhere he goes. But what's really disturbing is that, not only that, she starts following his dating relationships. You hear a testimony about another medical professional that he was dating, and she was following that person. Eventually, Brenda finds out about Kendra Hatcher. And Brenda's able to tell that this thing is moving fast. And Brenda is extremely upset. And Brenda very quickly comes to the decision that she wants Kendra Hatcher killed. 
because she wants Dr. Funny out of the Brenda, the evidence will show you, approaches several people to enlist them in killing Kendra Hatcher. She asks a cousin, a first cousin, Moses Oliveira. She promises him help with his child support payments and help buy a car if he would hurt Dr. Paniagua for her and also kill Kendra Hatcher. Moses has a good sense to say nothing. And then he tells his mother, his mom tells him, you need to stay away from She approaches a gentleman by the name of Milton Martinez. She asks him if he knew anybody that would be willing to hurt someone for her. Milton has good sense to say no and stay away from Brenda. Somehow, some way, Brenda reinserts herself into the life of a woman by the name of Jennifer Cowboy. And Jennifer will tell you that she was at a very dark place in her life at that point in time. Brenda asked Jennifer, I will give you $2,000 to kill Kendra Hatcher. And Jennifer agrees. In August, August the 7th of 2015, Jennifer Calderon moves into an apartment with Brenda Delgado. The evidence will then show you that several days later, approximately August the 12th, Jennifer Calderon invites a friend to come over to the apartment complex to go swimming. That friend, her name is Crystal Cortez. For whatever reason, shortly after that day, Brenda and Jennifer Calderon fall out. And Jennifer moves out. What Jennifer did not know was even though they had just met, Brenda Delgado quickly starts recruiting Crystal Cortez into helping kill Kendra Hatch. Crystal will tell you that she agreed to do it. Crystal will tell you that it was her idea for them to, every single day, for two weeks prior to her death, they followed Kendra Hatch every single day. Now, through Crystal Cortez, Brenda Delgado meets two men, a gentleman by the name of Kelly Ellis, and that man sitting over there, Christopher Love. At their very first meeting, Brenda asked Christopher Love if he'd be willing to kill Kendra Hatcher. And without any hesitation, he says yes in exchange for a combination of drugs and money. And he too then shortly joins them in the daily surveillance of Kendra Hatcher. On September the 2nd of 2015, the evidence will show that they met Brenda Delgado, Crystal Cortez, and Christopher Love. They met early that morning to carry out the killing of Kendra Hatcher. You will see that afternoon video evidence of a black jeep with Crystal and this defendant outside the parking garage of Kendra's apartment. You will then see later that evening they return approximately 7, 17 p.m. And you will see them enter the parking garage, wait for the gate to open, and follow another car to the garage and park. Approximately 30 minutes later, Kendra comes home and you'll see her come to their parking garage. You will then see, as she enters the parking garage, she goes down a slightly down ramp and parks her car. Almost simultaneously with that, you will see a figure step out of the dark into the light and walk down to where she parked her car. Now, you won't see the shooting of Dr. Hatcher, but you will see within seconds that same figure walks back to that black Jeep, gets in it, and they drive off. You will never see more than one individual get out of that Jeep. You will also hear that the next day, at this point in time, this offense was getting a ton of news coverage and publicity. You will hear that the next day, 
Crystal Cortez and the defendant Christopher Love, they're in a panic. Because for some odd reason, they weren't expecting this offense to generate any publicity. You also hear that Chris, uh, Brenda, her response to the rise in media attention is calmly say, I'm going to Mexico. Now, there will be a gentleman by the name of Jose Ortiz who's going to testify. And he's going to tell you that that evening, the evening of this offense, he is at home. And he gets a call and someone is saying, Jose, that's your Jeep on TV. Jose's going to tell you that he's confused about that because just that morning, he had loaned his Jeep to Brenda Delgado. So obviously the police, when Jose talks to them, he tells them that he'd given the Jeep to Brenda. They bring Brenda in. And Brenda denies having anything to do with it. Tells him, you need to talk to Crystal Cortez. I let her use the Jeep. You need to talk to her. By the time they bring Crystal Cortez in, Brenda has already left for Mexico. Crystal comes in and talks to the police. And it's torturous because she tells so many lies about what she did or what she didn't do that day. And each time she tells a lie, she adds a detail. And what she's not realizing is each time she adds a detail, she adds another way that she's tying herself to this offense. Eventually, after many hours, it just collapses on her, and she admits to being involved in this. But she still doesn't tell the whole truth. She doesn't tell the whole truth until approximately September the 18th of this year. But Crystal is charged with capital murder. During their conversation with Crystal, she has given them a description of the shooter. She has told them that he drives a the Chrysler Sebring with a black convertible top. And she has told them the general area where he usually is, an apartment complex called Surrey Road. Now, during their investigation, you will find out that the police seized two cell phones. Brenda's cell phone before she left town and Crystal's cell phone. And as a result of the records from those cell phones, they find one number common to both phones. That number belonged to Christopher Love. Based on finding that one common number, they get a warrant to do what's called GPS tracking on that phone because they have a strong suspicion that that phone number belongs to the shooter. And they begin to GPS track that cell phone. The evidence is going to show you that they knew what kind of car they were looking for. They knew what area to go look for that car. And when they start tracking that phone, Detective Lee Thompson will tell you that he went to that apartment complex, and as soon as he pulled into that apartment complex, he sees that car immediately. And after sitting on that car for a period of time, they see this man walk out of an apartment and get into that car. When well, they're tracking that phone, and you hear evidence that as they are tracking that phone, when he leaves, that tracking is going the same direction as he's moving, the exact same direction. He drives off to an adjacent apartment complex and pulls in the parking lot and stops. The tracking stops. Lee Thompson will tell you that when he's in that parking lot, there are two other people with him, a female by the last name of Colvin and a gentleman by the name of Kelly Ellis. They approach Mr. Love, Mr. Ellis, and Ms. Colvin for identification. They talk to them. And Lee Thompson will tell you that he called back to headquarters and said, hey, that phone that we are pinging or tracking, dial it. They dialed it. And the phone with Mr. Love's car, sitting on the hood of his car, rang. He's brought in for questioning on this offense. Now, I'm gonna let you know, he is in there with Detective Eric Barnes for approximately 20 hours. And in those 20 hours, he denies being involved in this offense. <coughs> he doesn't know Crystal Cortez. 
he doesn't know Brenda Delgado. Somewhere around probably hour 18 of talking to Eric Barnes, Detective Barnes, Detective Barnes comes back to tell him, guess what? We found a gun. And we found a gun hidden in your car. And the evidence will show that that gun was tested and that gun matches up with the shell casing found inside Dr. Kendra Hatcher's car. That gun is the gun that was used to kill Dr. Hatcher, found in his car. You will see for yourself how immediately his demeanor changes. He admits it being his gun. He now admits that he knows Crystal Cortez. He now admits that he knows Brenda Delgado. And he now admits that he was there. And he participated, but he's not the shooter. The forensic evidence that you see will prove that to be false. Because when she's found, there's a shell casing inside the passenger well of her front passenger seat. And what this man doesn't know, forensically, we're going to be able to show that any, any automatic handgun, when it's fired, that shell casing goes up and to the right, which indicates he was, she was shot by somebody close by. Even more importantly, you will hear forensic evidence that she had gunshot residue powder on her hands, on the back of her hands, consistent with someone putting their hands up, turning around, trying to protect themselves. And you also see evidence that she was shot in the back of her head. The other evidence that you will see is a phone call between this man and his girlfriend the day he hit the, hits the jail. And there's two passages in that phone call that I'm going to ask you to pay particularly close attention to. At one point in the phone call, he and his girlfriend are talking, and she asks him, why didn't you get rid of that gun? And his response is, I don't know. I don't know. It's just being stupid. A few minutes later in the conversation, she says to him, if you shot that lady, you should have got rid of the gun. And his response is, I know. I know. At the end of this trial, when we have finished our evidence and the jury charge is given to you, we will have proven this case by witness testimony. We will have proven it by forensic testimony, forensic evidence. And we will have proven it by just pure, simple common sense. Police court, state calls, bonding, James. Is the defense which you make out of these statements? You're on the defense, you don't deserve a right to make a statement. Please call your first witness, Mr. Bonnie Jameson. 